Hello and welcome to the lecture series on basic cognitive processes. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. Uh, today, we will talk about theories of object recognition. You have seen till now that we have been talking about perception, we have been talking about various theories of perception. Uh, today, we will uh, take a particular case and we will see how we interact and how we understand and recognize objects in this external world. Now, there have been a variety of theories uh, that have been proposed in order to explain how visual recognition is achieved. Uh, these theories may differ depending upon the theoretical stance they take, say for example, whether they are bottom up theories or they are top down theories. You might know already uh, using the previous lectures that bottom up theories basically focus upon uh, developing uh, or using the information coming from the sensory experience uh, to develop mental representations and top down theories basically uh, uh, favor the theoretical stance that uh, you know it is our memory and it is our experience and knowledge of the world that helps us build mental representations of the external world. Now, we will just, we are just adding a case there. We are saying uh, whether uh, it is the sensory experience uh, that leads us to form representations of the objects, uh, whether it is that information that helps us to recognize and interact with objects versus uh, whether it is our memory and our knowledge of the world that helps us interact and recognize objects. That is the kind of a difference, uh, you know, we can talk about. All in all, all in all, basically the attempt of these object recognition theories is basically uh, to be able to account for the excellent uh, capacity of object recognition that we have, uh, the fact that we make errors uh, very rarely and the fact that we do object recognition rather quickly. Uh, there are two problems of object recognition, we referred to this while we were talking about MAR is that there are two uh, kinds of representation possible if you are talking about a particular object. Uh, one form of representation is if you are taking an object in variant view, uh, you are talking about uh, the representation of the object uh, which is uh, an object uh, centered representation versus if you are talking about a viewer centered representation. Say for example, I am looking at a flower pot you know uh, standing on the window uh, of my house, uh, how does that flower pot look if I move around versus what is the general perception of that flower pot which will not change irrespective of how I move around about in the room. So, these are some of the problems which are there in object recognition. We will try and see uh, how uh, uh, these various theories have attempted to solve those problems. Now, uh, there, have, there are variety of theories, we will talk about that, uh, but uh, the, uh, one of the most uh, basic theories of object recognition could be uh, something like a template matching theory. Now, a template matching theory basically uh, uh, says that you know we compare the stimulus, the, we compare the sensory input uh, with a set of templates that we already have. Okay. So, you might already have a template of how uh, you know a particular ball looks like or how a particular uh, you know toy looks like and you kind of have this template and you kind of have these uh, specific patterns and what you are trying to do here is match this uh, set template which is there in your head with the sensory input. So, you compare the incoming sensory input to a variety of uh, templates you might have and you select a particular template that matches the sensory input to the best. Okay. Say for example, you have templates A, B and C and the input is let us say D, uh, you will kind of choose uh, either of A, B or C depending on the degree of match between D and either of these. Say for example, A matches 65 percent, the other two matches um, you know let us say 20 and 15 percent. So, you will choose probably uh, the uh, you know uh, template of A because that matches uh, D more uh, than the other two. Okay. Uh, in this template matching account, we were looking, we are basically looking uh, for the exact match between the stored template and the input representation. It's not even uh, 65 or something like that. We are kind of thinking of a uh, 100 percent match between uh, this uh, template that we have stored and uh, the representation or the sensory input that is coming in. I will show you an example. Uh, suppose uh, you see, you know, here there are different ways of writing, let us say pattern perception, you will see that depending on different people's handwriting, uh, the templates of uh, just these set of alphabets can be really different. 
Now, uh, suppose you are a system which is supposed to recognize each of these things, uh, as soon as the template kind of uh, varies by uh, you know uh, 1 degree or 2 degrees, uh, you will already uh, st uh, ha start having a, uh, trouble in recognizing these patterns. An example of these kind of uh, things could be you know the, uh, the machine recognition sh systems uh, that uh, examine for example your signatures in your uh, you know checkbooks. Uh, if say for example, you have just made a very small mistake in your signature, you have kind of you know, uh, uh, say for example, you, there is a superscript and there is a, a subscript, if the subscript and superscript are kind of shifted a little bit, uh, the machine recognition system uh, which kind of matches this uh, signature of yours with the signature that you have given at the time of uh, opening the account and if that matches less than uh, a particular amount, uh, it will not recognize it. Okay, so, that is the problem with these template ma matching accounts. The problem is that these are extremely inflexible theories. If a letter uh, were to differ uh, you know from the appropriate template even slightly, uh, the pattern will never be recognized. So, but that degree of freedom is not there. And you see that say for example, our systems uh, the uh, uh, you know recognition systems that we have are actually very good at it. You know they do not say for example, if I am writing a particular word or you are writing a particular word uh, and obviously given that our writings will be really different, you are still able to read that word perfectly. So, it kind of tells us that maybe we are not really using a template, ma a template matching account and in that sense we will let us, uh, we will kind of move on to other models as well. Now, uh, the template models in that sense uh, by the way, uh, they are useful uh, also, but they are kind of useful only and they work only for isolated letters, numbers and other uh, simple two dimensional kind of shapes. Okay. So, if you have a really very, very simple kind of a setup, obviously then maybe the template matching account would work, but not uh, really for complex configurations, say for example, uh, cursive handwriting for a large word. Uh, that kind of brings us to a different kind of theory of uh, object recognition. Uh, this theory is known by the name of feature analysis theory. Uh, now, this analysis, this theory basically proposes that, uh, you know, it kind of proposes a more flexible approach and this approach is about that any visual stimulus, say for example, uh, you know, a particular letter uh, for that matter is uh, supposed to be composed of a small number of characteristics or components. So, it says, uh, let us not have a fixed template, let us talk about the components that that make up that particular object or that particular pattern and what will we look for is not really the exact template, but we will look for the presence of these different components. Okay. Uh, an example could be say for example, if you talk about the letter R, uh, the letter R basically has three components, you know it has a vertical component, it has a curved component and it has a slanted component. Now, if I were a system that was uh, supposed to recognize the letter R and uh, irrespective of the you know the people whose handwriting I am kind of uh, recognizing, uh, I would assume that uh, the letter R will at least have these three features. Okay. So, in that sense I am not going to be troubled by uh, people's handwritings because anybody who writes the letter R will at least write these three components. Okay, so, uh, this is something which uh, wherein you find that you know the feature analysis theory might be good. You have this example, uh, you will see so these are these different letters and uh, this is basically how these uh, features are organized. So, you have straight horizontal vertical diagonal lines, you have a closed curve, you have intersections, you have symmetry about them. Uh, so, these are basically kind of features uh, which were shown by Gibson uh, that you know le how letters uh, really differ from each other with respect to these distinctive features. And Gibson believed that this is how we really uh, you know recognize these letters, this is how uh, even our uh, higher object recognition kind of uh, you know uh, mechanisms would work on. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the feature analysis theories, they propose that the distinctive features for each alphabet uh, remain constant uh, irrespective of whether the letter is handwritten or typed or it is a photograph of a letter, uh, anything. Okay. Uh, these models can also explain how we can perceive a wide variety of two dimensional patterns such as figures in a painting, design, fabric, those kind of things. Okay. Now, uh, feature analysis theories as a group and there are many theories we are kind of uh, discussing at a rather generic level, uh, feature analysis theories are consistent with both psychological and neuroscience research. So, Eleanor Gibbs, we have been uh, talking about of her research in the last uh, thing, uh, basically uh, demonstrated that people do require a relatively longer time to decide if the two letters are same or different uh, given that the two letters share a critical number of features. Say for example, if you have decide uh, between 
uh, whether a particular letter is an N or uh, whether it is an M, uh, you will see that these two letters share a lot of features. They all share a slanted line and two vertical lines. So, the idea is uh, because these two letters share these critical features, uh, your matching of these letters or say for example, the decision of telling that these two letters are different will take more time because what you are doing according to this particular theory is checking for each feature. So, you check for a pair of uh, vertical lines, you find them all right. You check for a slanted line, you find them, uh, find that as well. But once you start looking for the second slanted line or let us say the second, uh, the different direction slanted line, then you will find that M has it, but N does not. And in that sense, I am talking about a caps lock scenario. In that sense, you will find that these two things are different. This is what the feature analysis theory says about uh, recognizing these things. Uh, so, Larson and Bundesen, uh, they designed a model based on feature analysis that correctly recognized an impressive around 95 percent of the numbers written in street addresses and zip codes. Uh, even neuroscience research uh, also has, uh, you know, shown uh, that features, uh, and uh, you know, feature analysis is something that uh, we do. Uh, Hubel and Wiesel did this research with neurons and they found that those neurons basically can be tuned to, uh, you know, recognizing orientation, say for example, horizontal versus slanted versus vertical lines. Okay. So, you have these uh, set of neurons which actually code for specific features. In that sense, you could say that feature analysis theory of object recognition has some support from the neuroscience data as well. Okay. Uh, now, uh, but feature analysis also has uh, some related problems. Yeah, there, there are some criticism on feature analysis theories as well. Let us talk about those problems. Now, a theory of object recognition, uh, you know, simply should not just list the features. Now, the idea is if you are just uh, talking at the level of features and isolated features, you are not getting the entire, uh, you know, how those features are linked with each other, uh, what um, uh, in what way these uh, features are uh, jointed, those kind of things you will not, you are not really talking about. Okay. Uh, also, you can remember from the gestalt uh, view of perception that you know uh, an object is not really just components uh, and components uh, joined together does not really just give one object, it kind of the whole is more than the sum of its part uh, thing. Okay. So, uh, a theory of object recognition sh then should not simply list the features contained in a stimulus, it must also describe the physical relationship between those features, how are they linked together. Okay. Say for example, in the letter T, the vertical line supports the horizontal line, uh, whereas in the letter L, the vertical line is resting under the horizontal line, uh, so resting at the side of the horizontal line. Okay. So, you can look for a horizontal and a vertical line, but you will find that it is present both in L and T. So, you need to really specify how this linkage is there, only then you will be able to, uh, you know, uh, understand uh, why say for example, an L is different than a T. Now, the featured analysis theories were constructed to explain the relatively simpler recognition of letters. See, uh, the object recognition in itself is a bigger problem. Uh, featured analysis theories basically uh, started with uh, explaining us uh, the recognition of letters. So, they are kind of, uh, you know, taking a very simple uh, scenario and they are trying to solve a very simple problem. But if you really look at, uh, you know, objects in the world, you know, say for example, uh, plants and animals and automobiles and houses and those kind of things, uh, they are much more complex than just being, uh, you know, a concatenated set of features. So, in that sense, a feature analysis, uh, you know, uh, kind of falls short of explaining the, the uh, you know, the myriad problems in understanding or recognizing different objects. Uh, so, theory, uh, also something that you will see is that there, there are generally distortions, you know, things are moving uh, and there are uh, some kind of distortions in uh, features as well. Say for example, uh, if you were to recognize uh, what a cheetah looks like or say for example, what a horse look, uh, looks like uh, and you are looking at a horse while it is really running, uh, the features are changing, uh, you know, uh, uh, and the percept or the sensory input that you are getting is also changing. Okay. In that sense, it will become that much more difficult for a featured analysis theory to explain, uh, you know, what a particular object looks like. Uh, so, imagine say for example, you know, you have a particular uh, presentation in which the uh, features of the letters are mixing with each other or they are kind of moving. Say for example, if you are reading something written on uh, a flag for example, you know, the flag is moving with the wind uh, and uh, something that is actually horizontal does not look horizontal at the moment, it uh, you know, looks slanted uh, because the flag is uh, moved by the air. Uh, 
Now, those kind of things, uh, the feature analysis theory will find slightly harder to explain. Okay. Uh, so, let us move towards a different kind of a theory. Uh, another theory that we can talk about is uh, Irving Biedermann's uh, recognition by components theory. Now, what is this uh, recognition by components theory? Biedermann basically developed a theory to recognize three dimensional shapes. His idea was uh, similar to what Gibson was saying, uh, we are not really dealing with two dimensional entities in the external world, we are dealing with three dimensional entities. So, let us uh, you know develop a theory that will explain uh, understanding or recognition of three dimensional objects rather than two dimensional objects. So, with that the start, the basic assumption uh, of uh, recognition by components theory is that a specific view of an object can be represented as an arrangement of a simple 3D objects. And uh, so, Biedermann basically came up with these uh, simple 3D objects called geons. Okay, I will show you the geons in a short while, but these geons were supposed to combine and represent particular shapes or particular objects and the idea was that we are actually understanding each of these geons and that is what is leading uh, uh, you know to our understanding or recognition of the objects. You can see here say for example, you know you have uh, geons on the left side and you have these objects on the right side. Uh, and you can see each of these objects on the right side are actually composed of these uh, different geons. So, you can see say for example, the telephone is composed of geons number 1, 3 and 5. Uh, this thing uh, the cup uh, is basically made up of geons number 3 and number 5. Okay. So, this is basically uh, you know in, in some sense you know you, you kind of extract uh, this higher level feature uh, or say for example, you can extract this higher level component from the three dimensional objects that you see and you make a sense of that okay, if you combine this object with this object and uh, say for uh, you know the geon number uh, uh, 3 and geon number 5, this will lead us to forming what is called a cup. Okay. In some sense, uh, what you are doing is you are recognizing by these discrete components, it just uh, you know. Uh, so, all objects are basically uh, you know can be understood to be permutations and combinations of these various geons. Okay. This is pretty much what uh, you know the Irving Biedermann uh, model of uh, recognition by components was talking about. Uh, in general, uh, let us elaborate on this a little bit. In general, the arrangement of three geons would give people enough information to classify a particular object. In that sense, Biedermann's recognition by component theory is essentially a featured analysis theory as I was already saying for three dimensional objects. So, you have three features, you have a curved thing. Uh, if you look at this figure again, you have a, a cylinder which is uh, number 3, uh, you have a, a pipe like curved thing which is number 5 and you combine this cylinder with this pipe like thing, you get a uh, which is uh, an object. So, uh, this is what is a thing with this particular theory that you can combine these different uh, components and these components are pretty much as features uh, only and you can combine these uh, different components to get representations of objects in the world. So, Biedermann and colleagues basically they conduct this uh, fMRI research with humans and single cell recordings with monkeys and their uh, findings have shown that you know areas of the cortex uh, beyond the primary visual cortex uh, respond actually respond to geons as presented earlier. So, the thing is uh, we do have some coding for these uh, three dimensional features or three dimensional components and in that sense maybe we are sensitive to the how these components occur as parts of different objects and maybe that helps us uh, recognize these different objects. Okay. So, that is uh, some data which supports the uh, recognition by components theory. Now, uh, the recognition by components theory also requires an important modification because people will recognize an object more quickly uh, when those objects are seen from standard viewpoint. So, now the thing is this, uh, if you see a cup uh, or say for example, if you see a phone here, uh, this is one uh, representation of the phone or this is one representation of the cup. Suppose I invert the cup, suppose I kind of tilt the cup, uh, then the componential analysis might change a little bit. Okay, at least the feature extraction will change a little bit. Okay, so, you will need to uh, modify this recognition by component theory by a little bit because people will uh, recognize objects more uh, quickly from a standard viewpoint. What is uh, the standard viewpoint? It is a canonical viewpoint okay, rather than a much different or a non-canonical viewpoint. 
Now, a modification of this approach uh, basically uh, named uh, as the viewer centered approach. Uh, this approach by the way recognition of components in the standard form is a recognition is a object centered approach. Uh, but say for example, if you are a person who are moving around the room and having different views of these objects, you would uh, have to have what is called a viewer centered approach. Uh, the viewer centered approach basically proposes uh, that we store a small number of 3D objects as features or as components rather than just one view. So, we will just store uh, uh, you know a small number of views, we will see uh, what are the 3 or 4 views of a cup I can have. You store each of these 3 or 4 views and you kind of uh, develop a componential analysis of how these 3 or few views uh, will be made and that will lead to uh, understanding these components. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so, and when the uh, when you come across such an object, you will uh, mentally rotate the image of the object until it matches one of the views that is already stored uh, and in the memory and then say for example, by uh, uh, a combination of uh, a top down and a bottom up approach, you will recognize that particular object. Uh, we can now talk about as we uh, you know it is a good point to talk about top down influences. Now, uh, top down influences emphasize how a person's concepts and higher uh, level mental processes will influence object recognition. More specifically, how a person's expectations and memory may help you in uh, recognizing these objects. So, we can expect certain shapes to be found in certain locations and we can expect to encounter those shapes uh, because of past experiences. Say for example, if you are looking uh, you know at your study desk, you will expect to find a particular uh, say for example, a notebook there or maybe a pen there. Suppose I bring uh, a particular object and keep it, maybe I bring a cylinder uh, you know and keep it. Um, if you touch that cylinder, if there is no light, you are not really looking at it. If you touch that cylinder more often than not, you will expect it to be a pen. Maybe it is not, maybe it is a pipe for that matter. So, these kind of expectations kind of you know help us uh, fill the gaps in our sensory input. An example could be something like this. Uh, you see, uh, you can probably read this, the man ran, but you will see both the, the A's have the top part cut. So, it is technically perceptually not an A, but you will see uh, say for example, in the first case you read it at, as H, uh, in the second and the third case you know that this is A. Okay, even though it is exactly matching uh, you know the H in the first uh, word. So, you know what kind of thing to expect where and that is how the top down influence will modulate the, your sensory experience and help you generate a, a perceptual representation. Something like this, you know, this is something a uh, figure which I uh, a message which I found floating on the internet, uh, a lot of uh, Facebook memes about this, and it says that you can read this. Now, you can see, say, for example, the first letter uh, is basically replaced by a number, but that number perceptually resembles the letter it was supposed to say. If you read the, the first word, this is this, uh, the 7 basically resembles the T, and the 5 resembles the S, so you can still understand it is this. And say, for example, you talk about message, the second word, uh, E resembles s and uh, 3 resembles e and 5 resembles s. So, you can still make out that it is a message. Okay. Now, let us move to a special case of object recognition. Let us talk about face recognition. Now, according to psychologists, most people perceive faces in a slightly different fashion than they perceive other stimuli uh, and they say that face perception is uh, somehow really special. There is a lot of research into face perception uh, and it all of it suggests that faces are slightly special stimuli as compared to other objects in the world. Uh, young infants track the movements uh, of a photographed human face much more than uh, other similar stimuli. Say for example, uh, it shows that you know faces are socially or in some sense important to even the young infants. You know we are evolutionally probably uh, you know wired to treat faces as a slightly special stimuli and it makes sense because uh, say for example, uh, men being uh, or humans being social animals. Uh, this aspect of uh, you know recognizing a face is a socially important skill. Also aspects of recognizing the emotions of a face is also socially important. Suppose you are looking at a face of an individual and he suddenly shoots you, so uh, how will that uh, be understood? If you are not recognizing the face of the individual that this individual is angry and you know might act aggressively, if you are not really already on your feet, uh, you will uh, you know you will pay a, a huge cost. So, in that sense you can understand that faces are a socially important stimulus, they are special uh, class of stimuli. A lot of research uh, really talks about that, say for example, Tanaka and Farah in 1993 found that people were significantly more accurate in recognizing facial features when they appeared within the context of a whole face uh, rather than in isolation. So, you have to really look at the whole face, you are not uh, tuned to recognizing features of faces without the whole faces.
again something that probably is not true if uh, you are talking about objects and features. Okay. Uh, in contrast, uh, yeah, that is the contrast I was talking about when they judged houses, they were just as accurate in recognizing isolated houses or in isolated house features, say for example, a door or a window or a gate, something like that. Uh, this shows that we recognize faces on a holistic basis. We kind of have a, a holistic or overall understanding of what a face should look like, what are the features that holistically the, this particular object should have and that is how we kind of, you know, this organization of the eyes and the nose and the mouth and the ears is what we kind of look at as a face. Okay. So, it is kind of uh, in that sense slightly difficult if the eyes is are presented separately or if the nose is presented separately, uh, it will take slightly more time for you to recognize that. This makes sense is, uh, because face perception has a special status given the importance of our social interactions, something I was already talking about. Uh, there is also a lot of neuroscience research on face recognition, McNeil and Warrington, they studied a professional who had lost his ability to recognize uh, human faces after he experienced several strokes. This patient uh, at a later point changed his career, started to raise sheep, uh, but surprisingly it was found that he could recognize many of the sheep's faces, uh, though he could still not recognize human faces. Now, this special condition uh, was diagnosed uh, and uh, later termed as prosopagnosia, that is a condition in which people cannot recognize human faces uh, visually, uh, though they can perceive other objects relatively normally. So, it again is a clue to uh, how important uh, recognition of faces is for us as humans. Uh, the location in the brain most responsible for face recognition is the temporal cortex at the side of the brain, generally the right side, uh, specifically the inferotemporal cortex. So, the area uh, under the temporal cortex in the lower portion uh, that is, uh, is uh, you know what is implicated. It has also been shown that certain cells in the inferotemporal cortex respond especially vigorously when encountered with faces. So, this is the area which kind of lights up uh, when you are uh, you know presented with a particular face. Uh, also, it has been reported in a lot of fMRI studies that the brain responds much more quickly to faces presented in the upright condition uh, than to faces presented in the inverted position, because the configuration would change actually. And then you would probably have to apply a feature analysis or a uh, recognition by components kind of approach to see what faces. If it is uh, automatically, if it is in the canonical position, you will probably uh, gain uh, more information out of it much more quickly. So, this is uh, the representation, this is the, the yellow region is basically called the uh, fusiform gyrus, this is the region, uh, region which is actually responsible for us to recognize faces. Now, this was all about object recognition, uh, let us try and sum up, uh, we have talked about object recognition, we saw that object recognition can be uh, uh, achieved by a combination of top down and bottom up approaches, we also saw uh, that uh, perception of faces is a special case of object recognition, because faces carry much more information and social salience uh, as compared to some of the other objects that we uh, interact with. Thank you.